Welcome to the Friends of Dan Music Podcast. I'm Dan Miles. You've been listening to the music of Jim Beard. That's the title track from his first solo album, Song of the Sun, which he released in 1990. He's put out five more solo albums since then, which we'll be talking about and listening to some samples from. In addition to his own music, he's also been a prolific contributor, both in the studio and on stage, to a pretty staggering list of some of the finest musicians in the world, including Wayne Shorter, John McLaughlin, John Schofield, Mike Stern, Dennis Chambers, Victor Bailey, the Brecker Brothers, Ralph Bowen, Al Jarreau, David Sanborn, Larry Carlton, Chick Corea, Steve Vai, Marcus Miller, Dizzy Gillespie, Diane Reeves, Bela Fleck, and Esperanza Spaulding, just to name a few. Trying to cover the work he's done as a keyboardist, composer, arranger, and producer for all of these other artists would fill an entire podcast by itself, if not two or three. So we'll be focusing on his own outstanding studio releases instead. Let's get him on the line. Joining me on the phone from Windsor, Ontario, is Jim Beard. Welcome. Hi, Dan. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, in a moment, we'll explain what you're doing in Canada. Um, we just heard a, a sample of the title track from your first solo album, Song of the Sun. And what's going to be a theme throughout these proceedings, I want to talk a minute about uh, the album cover artwork. Uh, let me quickly describe it to the listeners. You've got an image of an orange sky and a giant yellow sun that's reminiscent of the classic scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark with the silhouettes of the workers digging at sunset. But in your picture, in front of the setting sun in the foreground, you have the silhouette of an ant. So what was this meant to symbolize? Um, you know, the, the best person you would want to ask would be Creed Taylor. Ah. Um, I think that was a photograph taken by uh, Pete Turner. Um, he was he did all those famous uh, CTI album covers. Yeah. And uh, when 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 Creed resurrected the label and uh, started making records again, he got Pete Turner back into the mix. And uh, I think you know I, I, Creed picked that out, and uh, I just went with it. Um, hmm. Mostly, it's just supposed to be uh, eye catching, which which it certainly is. In context of the sun. The ant looks gigantic, like a giant killer ant, but obviously it's just in the foreground. I'll have to look closer at it to see that it's a photograph. That's interesting. Yeah, Cree Taylor's name has definitely come up on the show before uh, in the Don Felder and Diodato episodes, so we've spoken about him. And I think my favorite track on that album is the one called Sweet Bumps. Which has, okay. That's kind of a Stevie Wonder, Herbie Hancock feel to it. Um, I also like the tracks Lucky Charms and Diana. Uh, but since we have so much to cover with all the other albums, I'm not going to play another track from Song of the Sun. I'm going to let that opening track suffice as a representation of it. But obviously, I recommend everyone go check that one out. Uh, the album you did in 1995 called Lost at the Carnival also has an interesting cover. It looks like a colorized black and white picture of an orchestra from the 1920s or 30s. Yes, um, that was an artist in San Francisco. His last name uh, is Beck. Um, his first name is escaping me now, but but he would he was uh, he would make these creations, uh, uh, theater scenes and uh, maybe circus scenes and things using like you know lots of different materials to make tiny creatures and uh, it just uh, Billy Ward was the, the the drummer on some of the tracks of that album actually suggested uh, that I look at some of this guy's um, artwork and it just seemed to. Uh, fit the uh, character of the music pretty well. It does, definitely. And a lot of the tracks on the album are segued with the ambiance of a fairground, which suggests to me separate events and experiences occurring at the same locale. So was there a, a specific unifying concept relating to that title of being lost at the carnival? Um, kind of, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I actually felt uh, conceptually that, that it was uh, a, a, you know, a development from, from where I was... Uh, creating a, what I was creating in Song of the Sun. I, I've always, uh, when I'm uh, composing, tried to uh, imagine characters and uh, what they look like, uh, what kind of clothes they're wearing, if they have a certain kind of walk. And uh, I like my music to sort of, uh, you know, be, be musical descriptions of maybe uh, different types of characters. Hmm. And... Uh, I was working on that title cut, and uh, Stan Harrison, uh, I was bringing him in to record, and he was listening to it, and he says, wow, this song makes me feel like I'm lost at the carnival. Oh, I and, see. Uh, and uh, I just said, 
I felt, okay, bingo, there's the name. Yeah, I really like the title track for sure, but the one I want to play is called Poke. Um, oh, yeah. And I have a theory about the title on it, so I'm curious to hear your explanation and uh, see if I'm right. You have a theory about the title of that song? Yeah, well, there's a couple of notes you hit in the chorus that are like in a different key than the rest of the song. That it's goes, right. It goes noticeably sharp. It's obviously intentional. So I assume that was your musical representation of like poking someone to get their attention. Uh, yeah, kind of. And, and uh, you know, for me, the, the most difficult part of uh, working on music, writing, and making albums can be actually coming up with the name of a song can be the most challenging part of it for me. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, that song was really inspired by, uh, uh, I was living uh, at One Lincoln Plaza uh, near Lincoln Center in Manhattan. And uh, in Central Park near uh, where we lived, there was this old carousel with, uh, with uh, the original pump organ in it. Yeah. And uh, playing, you know, carousel music. And the thing is, it, it was in dire need of repair. So, like, all these notes, you know, it would be playing a song you would recognize, but, like, there's all these clunker, wacky notes would, would be just popping out all over the place. Nice. And it has, a, it was just, you know, kind of charming. I, I like that. Wow, well, that's, uh, that's really interesting. You know, my grandmother in Southern California, when she got up well into her 80s and she couldn't live on her own anymore, we moved her up to Northern California and, and put her in a place. But her piano had two or three keys like that. And, and when I played her piano, I always had to avoid them. It was like an F sharp, I think, below middle C or an octave lower. It was like a G. <laughs> or, or a flat there's certain keys you had to watch out for um right. well great well let's uh let's listen to that from his 1995 lost at the carnival album here's my guest jim beard with poke
Yeah, well, that's definitely a cool one. Uh, some of my other favorites on that album are Grace in the Bubble and uh, Step Inside. Right, right. So next I want to talk about an album you released in 1997 called Truly, which features yet another interesting album cover. Now, the first time I saw the front, I thought it was some kind of animal face, like maybe an otter or a ferret. And then on the back, I saw the full image that reveals it's sort of an oddly proportioned clown figure. Um, yeah, so it's actually a wine decanter. Oh, okay. I'm a, I'm a collector of clown things, antique clown things, um, whether they're just figurines or I have a, a an orange juice squeezer that's a clown, hmm. um, the Murano glass clowns I have. And, and uh, I, I, j I had just gotten that one at a flea market and uh, was showing it to the photographer and... Uh, she suggested putting it under a, there was a fountain with water, so it's actually laying under water, which uh, gives it a, a different kind of look. Well, it's a memorable image, and Cree Taylor can't take credit for that one. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> now, I also uh, want to mention that on the inner sleeve, there are photos of you wearing a Bach-era wig surrounded by candles. So what's that about? Oh, boy. Um, you're kind of catching me off guard. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to have fun with the artwork, and, and that period of time, the uh, sort of mid-90s, there was a, a strong um, movement in music, sort of the, the Young Lions and Blue Note, and, and all this sort of, you know, lots of posing and serious looks and three-piece suits and, mm. you know, kind of the furled eyebrows with the attitude, and, and I just wanted to, like, it was my way of saying, you know, to heck with all that. Um, <laughs> I just uh, wanted to have fun with it, and you know, because I, I take my writing and arranging very seriously, and and, uh, and I get very fussy and picky, and, and uh, even when I'm, you know, attempting to achieve something that's humorous as an end result, it doesn't mean I work any less hard. Sure. But you know, I, I just thought, you know, the the, the 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 visual artwork is really a chance to just to just have fun. Well, it is that. It reminded me a little bit about those uh, switched on Bach, Walter Carlos. Where you'd have somebody oh, right. dressed like Bach on the cover. Right. Yeah, I remember those, yeah. Well, it definitely looked like a fun photo session. I was wondering if it related to the, the wine decanter at all. I guess it doesn't. No, no, it was just kind of supposed to be, you know, colorful. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the clown decanter was colorful, and uh, mm -hmm. I had uh, gotten the, uh, that, that actually, that jacket was, uh, I got that at a flea market as well. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, we just got the candles and uh, put on the wig and lit up the cigar and had some fun. <laughs> I guess the other thing it reminds me of is that movie Amadeus. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, there are many great tracks on that album to choose from. And even though it might not be the most representative track, I decided for the sake of the Pat Metheny fans in the audience, I had to go with Hand to Hand, which sounds like a lost Metheny track. And with good reason. I mean, you have two of his most recognizable vocalists singing on the track. I know you're in his band on a Secret Story Tour, so is that where you first met Mark and David? Um, I'd known Mark uh, Ledford before that. We had been doing work around uh, uh, the city, New York, sessions together, records. And, uh, but on the, the Matheny tour was when I first did meet uh, David. And they were both just incredibly talented musicians. Well, that's for sure. Uh, Multi-talented. Multi uh, you know, great singers, great instrumentalists. Yeah, that's their gig with Pat Metheny. I, I saw him in concert twice. I saw his Letter from Home tour, uh, which I think he had Pedro Aznar. I don't think they were on that one, but I saw We Live Here, and they were definitely there. And you'd look up, and they'd be playing a French horn. You'd look up again, they'd be playing an accordion. you look up again, they'd be playing a recorder. I mean, he was, uh, I heard David uh, Blamer say in an interview that, you know, Pat Metheny would just give him like a, a xylophone part. Here's the instrument. Here's the part. He wouldn't say, can you play this instrument? He just said, this is what you got to do. <laughs> right, right. Now, I didn't see the Secret Story tour live, um, but I did manage to track down a Japanese import VHS of it. Um, it cost me like 80 or 90, I think maybe in 100 bucks. It was kind of rare, which was kind of annoying because the gig was in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but the VHS came from Japan. But I didn't care. I, I really wanted to see it really badly. I know it was like a, an eight-piece band, including Pat and uh, Gil Goldstein, was also playing keyboards uh, along with you. So how did you coordinate who was going to play what? Did Pat leave it up to you guys, or did he sort of give it? Um, yeah, we just all sort of worked it out. Um, it seemed like um, you know there was a, lot, a fair amount of accordion uh, in the music, so obviously Gil would, would play that. Mm -hmm. um, mostly he was doing the, the keyboards, electric keyboards, because we had to recreate the, uh, the big symphonic thing. Yeah. Um, and I would 
through uh, mostly the piano and keyboards. It seemed that way, yeah, but you both had some pretty sizable rigs up there. and uh, Oh, yeah. You know, you yeah. both, in other words, a lot of stuff he played, maybe not the accordion, but a lot of stuff he played, you could have, and a lot of stuff you played, maybe he could have. So I was wondering if, if Pat said, you guys work it out, or if he said, you play this, you play that. I saw the show, and everything is, like, seamless, so I'm, I'm sure one way or another it got dialed in. Oh, yeah, it was not fun. That was, a, that was just a, a great experience all around. Well, even though this track is very much in the style of Pat Metheny, along with every other track on the album, it was actually written and arranged by my guest, Jim Beard. So let's listen to that from his 1997 Truly album, Here's Hand to Hand. Cheers. 